Hi. Greetings. We're on page 89 of Ray Francis' Crisis of Conscience. He has just been talking about the changes. The, the majority of the governing body at this point seem to favor changes, what mm. are taken to be radical changes by Fr mm. President Nathan Knorr and Fred Franz. Now they're going to talk about, now that Ray is going to report upon the votes that took place during this period from 1975 through about 77. And he ended the last part with a reference to a note he sent uh, mm -hmm. about the recommendations, and he thought it was innocuous enough. But that's not the way it worked out. And he also mentions that a Rio, Leo Greenlees, who was on the governing body in those days, he says in the footnote, a covering letter written by Greenlees accompanied the document and included this statement. Our recommendations are not motivated by dissatisfaction with the work as it has been administered heretofore, but mainly out of concern for the direction indicated by the Bible and watched our articles. We believe that once the scriptural principles are brought to bear on the matter, then the direction we should take is evident. So we believe at this point it seems to be everybody but, mm. but Fred Franz and Nathan Knorr, who is to live another two years beyond us. He says, the material came before the governing body, and in the session of September 10th, 1975, it was now obvious that by far the majority favored the basic change recommended. However, a second committee of five was assigned to make final adjustments. The body did not select either the president or vice president to serve on this committee since their opposition had been clearly stated. Now, this new committee of five is Milton Henshaw, Ewart Chitty, Lyman Swingle, Lloyd Barry, and Ted Jarris. The President's comments at this point mainly express doubt as to the practicality of the change. The Vice President, however, made plain that he viewed the presentation as an attack on, on the pre Presidency, and those four words are Fred Francis. When the President's own motion was read out to him, he replied that Brother Knorr had made that statement, quote, under duress, unquote. Okay. Where am I? Oh. Lyman Swingle expressed himself as feeling that all members of the body had respect for the president, did not view him as a, quote, poker-faced, immobilized figurehead of a do-nothing society, here using the vice president's language at the graduation exercises. He stressed that the president could still use his energy, drive, and initiative within the proposed arrangement. Later in the discussion, the vice president insisted that the Committee of Five's document did just what he had said was being done. He stated that at the coming annual meeting his vote would be for the corporation powers to continue and said that his talk at the Gilead graduation owed to a feeling of obligation to let the brothers know uh, this so that they would not feel that a hoax had been practiced on them. After the second committee completed its recommendations and submitted these on December 3rd, 1975, the matter came down to a final vote. The chairman called for a show of hands. All but two raised their hands in favor of the motion to implement the recommendations. The two who did not raise their hands were the president and the vice president. The following day, the body met again. The vice president said he had taken no part in the discussion the day before since he, quote, didn't want to have anything more to do with it, unquote. To participate would mean that he was in favor, and he, quote, conscientiously could not do so, unquote. He referred repeatedly to Nathan Knorr as the chief executive of the society and the chief executive of the Lord's people on earth. Mm -hmm and said that Je Jesus Christ is not down here on earth and so is using agents to carry out his will. Presumably the only two agents he's interested in would be him, president and vice president. president. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<clears throat> Dan Sidlik, a square-built, deep-voiced man of Slavic descent, said he would have been happy to see Brother Nor or Brother Franz turn to the scriptures or even to the Watchtower publications to support their position, but that was not the case. Leo Greenlees remarked that if all the congregations were glad to submit to the direction of the governing body, why not the corpor corporations also? The president basically confined his remarks to saying that he thought the corporation would act parallel to the governing body, but that instead the proposed arrangement subordinated the corporation, adding, which is probably correct. The vice president said he too thought the two organizations were going to run parallel, perhaps like Antioch and Jerusalem, and said, I never had in mind what the governing body wants to do now. It was obvious that the president and vice president were maintaining their opposition. Lloyd Berry, his voice strained and shaking with emotion, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> now pleaded with them that they make the matter unanimous since it was obvious that it would pass anyway. Another vote was taken. This time, President Knorr raised his hand, and the vice president followed suit. Four years later, in 1979, in a governing body session, Fred Franz, now president, stated that his vote for the change <coughs> back then was made under duress, the same words he used about Nathan Knorr. Mm -hmm. I would agree. When Nathan Knorr conceded, Fred Franz felt compelled to join him. He went on to say that he had not been in favor of the change then, and that from that point forward, he had, quote, just been watching, unquote, to see what would result. Mm. Now, the next page, we have a chart showing the six committees that are formed by this change starting, um, going into effect January 1, 1976. The six committees, by the way, are the service committee, the writing committee, the publishing committee, the teaching committee, the Personnel Committee, and the Chairman's Committee, all serving the interests of the Watchtower Bottom Tract Society, at, uh, illustrated at the bottom of the chart, and the Watchtower New York, and IBSA of England, and other legal agencies. Then he has uh, a comment from another rather invisible member of the governing body, John Booth. Oh. John Booth, a member of the First Committee of Five, and in early life a farmer from upstate New York, a gentleman who thought deeply but normally had difficulty in expressing those thoughts well, seemed to have best described what now became the case with the corporation. In one of the Committee of Five's first meetings, he had said, a corporation is just a legal tool. It's like a pen lying on the desk. When I want to use the pen, I pick it up. When I'm finished, I just lay it down until I want to use it again. That now became the position of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania and its subsidiary... Subs okay, I never say that right. Subsidiary? Right corporations. <laughs> Inevitably, that meant that the power of the presidency was decimated and virtually disappeared, that office now serving an almost purely legal function. Mm. Mm. This uh, subsidiary relationship doesn't last too long, but it appears, though. Mm. I guess into that next time. Mm -hmm. Our links are, let's see now, sects inevitable, but if Christ is worshipped, they do not turn into cults. This is a discussion of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, etc. Mm -hmm. And also, we'll put a link into that playlist, which is developing pretty rapidly now, the Corinthian playlist. Mm -hmm. Specifically, it's entitled Corinthians for Jehovah's Witnesses, but 
the material in there, I think, covers a much greater range of needs than just those of a of those in Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. See you next time. Bye.